I would like to thank my beautiful wife Andrea, my four children, and close friends. I've had time to reflect on the events in Cape Town and on the punishments handed down to me by the ICC and Cricket Australia and um, I want to say that I'm very sorry. I want to apologise to my family. Especially my wife and daughters. I love the game of cricket. I, I love entertaining young kids. I love kids wanting to play the great game of cricket um, that I love. Um, the two other things is any time you think about making a, a questionable decision, think about who you're affecting. You're affecting your parents and to see the way my old man's been. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, thanks everybody. And my mum, it's... If you haven't already watched the previous two parts, go and watch them first and then come back here. The links are in the description, or if you go to my channel, the full playlist of the documentary will be there. So, Smith, Warner and Bancroft are out for essentially 12 months of cricket after what occurred in Cape Town. The South African series, for all its cricketing highlights, is suddenly in the rearview mirror, and suddenly Australia has to try and survive without some of its best players ever. In this concluding episode, we're going to look at Sandpaper Gate's impact through two lenses. Firstly, cricketing impact, including the on-field performances and the additions of Payne and Langer, and then the cultural impacts, in particular how Smith and Warner are viewed by the public following the incident. Let's start with the cricketing impacts. The Cricket Australia board elected to make Tim Payne the full-time captain following the Sandpaper Gate scandal. The truth is that Payne, despite only regaining his spot in the team a few months prior, was still the best person suited for the Australian captaincy role. For one, on the surface, Payne looks a squeaky clean character. He answers questions like a politician, but isn't afraid to crack a joke if needed. He was mostly out of the limelight during his tenure back, only making small contributions here and there, while also having experience captaining Tasmania. Payne was perfect for the role in terms of managing a media storm. An older Tasmanian player who has only just regained his spot after years in the test match wilderness. He was the underdog story the Cricket Australia board needed in order for supporters to get around the team on their path to redemption. The next question was who should be the coach? There was only ever one answer to that question. For a long time, Justin Langer was seen as the heir to Darren Lehman's throne. A hard-edged cricketer in his playing days, Langer had moved into coaching Western Australia and the Scorchers, in which he was highly rated by his players. The fit was perfect. The Australian team was under fire for cheating and poor behaviour, so the ideal person to bring in was a legendary player from the previous generation who knew how to bring his players into line. In the period, performances mattered for very little to be honest, with more value being placed on how the team behaved as opposed to how much they won. During Smith and Warner's ban, Australia won just 3 out of 8 test matches. While disappointing, they were winning back the respect of the fans off the field for how they played. Australians love underdog stories and Australia's most high-profile side was suddenly the biggest underdog in the country. Once Smith & Warner did return to the side in 2019, the team was loved by the Australian public. Smith's leadership style, which often saw tempers flare and arguments with the opposition, as well as umpires meaning they often came across as a bunch of spoiled brats, whereas Payne's team looked like a group of hard-working players looking to make the country proud. Whether either was the case in reality mattered very little, as perception is everything and that perception peaked with their performance in the 2019 Ashes, where despite an all-time series performance by Ben Stokes and Stuart Broad, Australia got the job done, retaining the Ashes. At some point down the track, I'm gonna make a full video about how Langer and Payne rebuilt Australian cricket in greater detail, but I just don't have the time in this video to talk about how incredible a job they did with the odds heavily stacked against them. So with that being said, is it happily ever after? Since the events of Cape Town, there has been a large feeling that Australia's cricketers are somewhat walking on eggshells on the field. Because of the high profile nature of what happened in South Africa, whenever Australian players misbehave in the slightest on the field, questions about culture are then raised. Following Sandpaper Gate, everyone said their piece about Australian cricket in terms of behaviour, with some like Stuart Broad the most interesting given that he once middle one to first slip and didn't walk. But even after the many years following the scandals, there still seems to be a magnifying glass closely trained on the behaviour of the Australian cricket team. 
One key example is that of Steve Smith during the SCG test in 2021. After scoring an incredible century in the first innings of the match, Smith merely shadow batted and then marked center on the crease while fielding in India's fourth innings. The act was harmless, Smith was shadow batting left handed to see things from Pant's perspective before turning around to mark center. Ask yourself seriously, would you consider that cheating? Players often do things in the field that may be considered stupid or slightly out of line, but cheating? I wouldn't think so. Does a player cheat if they leave their crease early for a run? No, but it is against the rules. In a sport with as many grey areas as cricket, there is no doubt that often the lines are blurred between what makes someone a cheat or not. Sandpaper on the ball is cheating, not marking the centre. The media however had a field day with a number of experts having their say and branding Smith's act as cheating. If this wasn't Steve Smith, but a player from a different nation, I just wouldn't see it being this big of an issue. This is the perfect example of the hole the Australian cricket team dug itself into when they committed the act in Cape Town. For the lengths of these players' careers, extra focus will be placed on their on-field behaviour and acts. Another impact of Sandpaper Gate is how Cricket Australia branded the players following the scandal, and in particular how they turned David Warner into the scapegoat for the incident. If we rewind to the previous episode, you'll remember I pointed out that apparently Warner was the ringleader behind what happened in Cape Town. And while the suggestion of players since then has been that it was the case, there is zero concrete evidence of that being his specific role in the scandal. Warner has been silent, and to his credit has not disclosed the true actions of everyone in the dressing room that day. But what has become of Warner since Sandpaper Gate is the view that he is the one to blame for what occurred in Cape Town. That is largely down to the message conveyed by Cricket Australia in regards to the bans handed down. Warner got the harshest punishment. Alongside his one year ban, he was also banned from any leadership position in the team for life, whereas Smith only received one year extra. It was a bizarre part of the punishments given that Smith was the physical captain of the team. I think most expected Warner to receive the same punishment as Smith. Some have speculated that maybe Warner's key role in the players' pay dispute in 2017 may have been part of the decision, suggesting that Cricket Australia may have wanted to get one back over the opener. The most distasteful of the events around David Warner's career since the scandal is that when attempting to appeal the verdict last year, Cricket Australia returned with a negative message, stating that yes he can appeal, but a final public inquiry would have to be made in order for Warner to regain his leadership positions. Some described it as a public lynching. In essence, Cricket Australia was looking to use Warner's appeal as some way of painting themselves as the shining light attempting to cleanse David of his past misbehaviours. Understandably, Warner wanted no part in that, and why would you? After being branded as the destroyer of Australian cricket for so long, why would he want to prolong the pain his mistake caused for him and his family? The potential gain from the trial wasn't worth it for the negative publicity it would create. It's a shame because since the scandal, Warner has turned his on-field behaviour around drastically. He's more measured as a player and overall seems to be enjoying his cricket more of late. And maybe that's because he has finally been able to rid himself of the stupid role given to him within the team that made him the bully to the opposition. To be frank, Warner and Smith both needed those 12 months off to take a deep breath and find their love for the game again, and I think they would agree that they have returned as better people for their time off the field. Sandpaper Gate was a disaster for not just Australian cricket, but cricket as a whole. It shook how we understood the game, the players, and the external factors often forgotten outside of the boundary. Smith, Warner and Bancroft were the chief orchestrators behind what happened in Cape Town. The captain and vice captain had created a culture in which winning was the absolute number one priority, no matter the consequences. However, when the consequences came, they were far worse than any of these three could have ever imagined. What can't be understated, however, is the role Cricket Australia played in the incident. The way they advertised their players for their own gain, just to tear them down when it suited them, only to build them back up again, is one of the lesser talked elements of the scandal. Smith and Warner eventually found their redemption. Warner learned to once again enjoy and find the satisfaction for cricket which seemed to elude him for so long. He struggled in his first series back, but upon returning home found his group again. And oh boy, when Davey Warner gets going, it is so bloody good to watch. Steve Smith, the man dubbed the best since Bradman, plundered England in the 2019 Ashes with even the most diehard of England fans and pundits standing to clap the batter when he was dismissed for the final time in the series. He had won back the respect of the cricket community with his on-field performances. 
Yes, he still has his staunch haters, which is also fair enough. Not every player needs to be liked. Everyone has their own favourites and ones they don't like as much. And to be honest, after South Africa, there is enough reason to hate Steve Smith. But it feels as though even the strongest of haters of Smith, as well as David Warner and Cameron Bancroft, have found a way to respect him once again. Cricket fans have chosen this path for them, and they haven't done it by just scoring hundreds and taking great catches. They've done it with how they have carried themselves and acted post Sandpaper Gate. That is the leading currency for players in gaining love from fans. I truly believe that time heals all wounds, and slowly but steadily, the cricket community is beginning to forgive. But we must not forget the events of Cape Town 2018. Sandpaper Gate and all that occurred in the lead up, as well as the aftermath, is an important lesson for all cricketers in regards to what happens when you betray the love that millions have for the sport. We still don't know the ins and outs of the madness that occurred in the change rooms at Newlands, and so many questions are still left unanswered. Many have said that once the players write their autobiographies post-retirement, the information will be released, but I just don't see this happening. This Australian team is tight, and there still seems to be strong relationships all through the team. After what occurred in Cape Town, for that to be the case is incredible. For a team to be so broken, so disgraced, and so ruined to earn back the respect of the public is nothing short of mesmerising, and something unique to this team. And maybe that is because deep down, Aussies still have that affection for the Australian cricket team. Because it is the nation's team, and the nation was betrayed by Sandpaper Gate, and the imagery of that crazy time in Australian sport will truly live in all of our minds forever.